often and extensively used in the research even today um, and also in the public policy making he was the founder of um, founder director of ris research and information systems uh, which is under the ministry of external affairs uh, new delhi and he was a member secretary of the very famous pc alexander committee that laid foundations for uh, trade reforms in india i mean uh, the, the kind of reform that we have seen in 1991 the basics of that 1991 reform in uh, pc alexander committee and uh, so panchamukhi was the member secretary of that uh, important committee he was a chairman of indian council of social science research a president of the indian economic society for three consecutive years and currently the founder chairman of the indian economic society trust um, which has been uh, doing uh, you know immense service to the profession apart from economics professor panchamukhi is also very well known as a sanskrit scholar he was a chancellor of the rashtriya sanskrit vidyapeeth tirupati and currently the chancellor of sri guru sarvabhauma sanskrit vidyapeeth vidyapeetham mantralaya and uh, also president of the national institute of vedic science uh, bangalore uh, he will be chairing this today's lecture so thank you very much sir for accepting our invitation and being part of this uh, 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 lecture today's lecture uh, would be given by dr rb barman uh, dr barman is a very well known statistician of this country his contributions to the statistics data warehousing and payment settlement systems at the rbi uh, where he served over three decades in the uh, in the statistics department and retired as executive director in the rank of deputy governor is really immense in fact the students who are actually accessing rbi data under the dbie that is uh, database on indian economy is actually brain child of dr rb barman uh, dr barman is also past president of the indian economic society and currently the managing trustee of the tais trust above all today is a very important day for dr barman uh, he has received professor mihi pc mahanlobis award for his lifetime contributions to statistical sciences today uh, from the government of india ministry of statistics and program implementation we would like to congratulate uh, dr barman on this occasion and in fact he is only the second person to receive this award um and the first one was received by uh, dr c rangaraja uh, uh, and in, indeed it's an honor that dr barman has agreed to give this statistic day lecture on a very important topic which is also close to his heart um, uh, the topic is indian official statistics in the context of un resolution in 2014 um uh, thank you sir i welcome you to this uh, statistics day lecture uh before i request yeah before i request professor panchamukhi to give the chairperson's remark i also want to recognize the presence of uh, uh I, i'm not sure professor kel krishna has joined he said he will be joining us uh, professor m ramachandran president of the indian economic society other members of the ties uh, especially the executive council members and all the participants who are attending this lecture i also want to thank my colleagues especially bipin and rajesh who are managing the event from behind so um with this um uh, i request professor panchamukhi to give uh, uh, inaugural chairperson's remarks um then i will go to uh, dr parman's lecture over to you professor panchamukhi sir yeah thank you very much dr paramurthy um we are not able to get the your uh, video are you not on the video um, uh, uh, due to some yeah now i i think i'll come oh okay i'm only ah yeah now you you're coming yeah i i, I would only see barman yes. and uh, also party will be covered and all others are not available on the video anyway yes so, go ahead welcome right? welcome to this interesting and unique event organized jointly by the base university and the indian economic society trust um uh, here on webinar and as you all know we are now have to conduct our meetings in the webinar mode 
and not in any other manner because of the pandemic and the restrictions that it imposes on our lifestyle. And um, uh, I would first of all like to congratulate once again Dr. Burman for receiving this prestigious Maharanavis Award on the National Statistics Day. As we know, the first award was received by Dr. C. Rangarajan and the second award is being received by our colleague and um, whom we have a lot of esteem regard, Dr. Burman. <laughs> and, um, uh, and we are broadly aware of his uh, contributions to econometrics and the official statistics system. He is known for uh, bringing in the digitization of payments in the country. If we make every vendor to receive payments through phone pay or uh, Google Pay or any other types of uh, digitized mode, we should go into the origin to the initiatives taken by Dr. Burman and this has resulted in a lot of easing of transactions and avoidance of cash uh, flow which had shown risks and uncertainty. And, and, and he has also made contributions in many other fields as uh, chairman of the International Statistical Commission which was set up as a result of the um, uh, uh, as a result of the recommendations of the National Statistical Commission headed by Dr. S. Rangarajan, of which I had the privilege of being a member uh, some years ago. And oh, one of the principles, one of the recommendations of the National Statistical Commission was uh, to set up the National Statistical Commission as a, a statutory body independent of the government. But many of the recommendations have been have not been implemented. And then you became chairman of the National Statistical Commission. I recall he made a list of all uh, Rangarajan's How during his presidentship we collected a lot of funds in addition to what we have been able to do earlier and put the payment, the award of the Mahalanobis Award and other awards on a permanent footing. He uh, got a lot of uh, money uh, during his period. The Bombay Conference when CR Rao attended was a very unique event. And subsequently, of course, Dr. Bhanamurti and Nishan Mugam and others have been raising, adding resources by organizing many small events here and there. And their contribution to the funding of the uh, ties uh, has been very unique. But uh, the foundations laid down by me to some extent and then later extended by Dr. Burman are very commendable and we have to remember that. Uh, today I will not take any more time except to say that the subject which has chosen for its presidential address, Indian Official Statistics, in the context of UN Resolution 2014. There would be, there are many times, many resolutions in the UN, UN uh, Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, and the statistics. The, uh, but you know, how far do we implement them? Is an issue which we need to uh, pay about and make our statistical systems conform to the sound principles which the uh, official statistics uh, have to follow as put um, down by the UN resolution. The fundamental principles of official statistics are very important. One of them is within trust in official statistics, the statistical agencies need to decide according to strictly professional considerations, including scientific principles and professional ethics, 
on the methods and procedures for the collections, processing, uh, storage, and presentation of statistical data. I feel this is a very basic principle. Even in the National Statistical Commission, uh, Dr. Rangarajan and uh, other members used to uh, uh, remind the members that we should have the reliability, the comprehensiveness, and timeliness of data. These three principles were laid down. And here, to retain trust on in official statistics is very important. I'm sure Dr. Burman will throw light on how these principles are being pursued. Another point I wanted to mention, during National Statistical Commission's functioning, Rangarajan used to come and invariably Dr. Burman used to come with him. And I find that Dr. Burman's inputs in the deliberations of the Statistical Commission were uh, so basic, so profound, so principled that I used to get really impressed by his workmanship and the contributions to the deliberations of the National Statistical Commission. I recall how he used to bring data and analysis and contribute to Rangarajan's deliberations presentations. With these two, two words of introductory nature, I will come back after the presentation. If we have any comments, we will have uh, more time for Dr. Burman to make the presentation and enlighten us. Once again, greetings and congratulations to you. And sure, this will be the basis for many more um, uh, laurels who will, will come your way, because you have been. You have been Still young, energetic, and enthusiastic to make academic contributions. I wish you all the best in your future career, and all of us join in uh, greeting you and conveying your best wishes on this very auspicious day. I don't have to say much on this Mahalanobel, which uh, Mahalanobel is already clearly stated. We in the Econometric Society have the Mahalanobel medal. A very prestigious award um, to statisticians and economicians uh, of repute, both at the national level and the international level. So we are happy to have this event um, today, and I, I call uh, Dr. Burman to make, present his uh, thoughts on this subject, which he has already circulated a paper, and he will elaborate and explain to us to make us wiser on the subject. And afterwards, I think if the time permits, if uh, the organizers, Space University, Dr. Banu Mukti and others agree, and if Dr. Banan agrees, we'll give some time for questions and answers for discussions. Normally, we don't have question answer sessions in the invited lectures, but we can have some time available for that. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and honor. And I request Dr. Burman now to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I request Dr. Burman to uh, yeah. give his uh, lecture? And uh, I request all the participants, uh, those who have any questions, uh, to type in the chat box uh, so that uh, we can take it at the end. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Uh, yeah, I think let us get uh, into the first slide of my presentation. Let us get done and from there I will take. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, I must thank Professor Panchamukhi and Dr. Vanamurthy uh, uh, who are so kind and uh, uh, who, who have, uh, I think, uh, how do I express? Uh, I think who, who, who have told uh, so much of good things uh, about uh, me. Now, let me go back to 2005 when both uh, Banamurthy was uh, elected as secretary to Indian Econometric Society and in Amritsar and I was appointed, I was elected as uh, president of Indian Econometric Society 
before that of course i served as vice president for 3 years so uh, i think my association with the indian econometric society goes back to about 88 89 and since then i know professor panchamukhi and uh, let me let me honestly express that he has been very very kind to me always supportive always encouraging and i think uh, that is the kind of a thing uh, which gives us a kind of a fuel uh, to go on and go on so many of the people after they retire do not get so much involved into the activities they have been doing before uh, when they were in active life but uh, uh, see i is a i retired uh, will be as back 13 years back but uh, because of this kind of an activities possibly i am still continuing with it but uh, let me also say i see we have uh, professor panchamukhi and me we have uh, something common very common uh, he started uh, with statistics being a first class first gold medalist in statistics uh, joined the bombay university and that at a particular stage game theory i think uh, was one uh, which uh, really teased his mind and he continued with that and he went for the trait theory where there was a huge lot of application and then slowly slowly from pure statistics uh, i think uh, as he became an econometrician for me also after coming to reserve bank seeing the challenges of uh, the economy uh, i think i also got into the econometrics now let me tell the indian econometric society was founded by professor c r rao uh, he is our founder president he is in his uh, 101 year last year we commemorated him we are looking forward to uh, do something very very special uh, this year when he turns uh, um, 101 years so now the the early history of indian econometric society if you look at it was mainly the statisticians who were driving the kind of a uh, econometrics uh, it is uh, professor mohanabish with his uh, model for the second plan even before uh, professor c r rao which is the dawn of international uh, kind of statistics uh, we are doing because see those days uh, see running a regression equation itself was very difficult and the people coming from economic stream i think had those kind of a challenges people coming from statistics uh, like me and professor panchamukhi even inverting a 4 by 4 matrix for doing a kind of a regression exercise uh, was tough because very few of us had the access of computer and that computer also was relatively rudimentary but uh, come Uh, towards the end of 80s and 90s and when laptop and computer became available i think slowly slowly i think uh, econometrics has started getting into many people today we are very happy as a uh, providing a platform through indian econometric society we have got a large number of people as members and i am also happy that now majority of the the people come mainly from the uh, economics field there are there are of course people like me and professor panchamukhi who are basically from statistics field uh, to come to the economics i i will tell you why you know, why statistics is so important for econometrics uh, can we go to the next slide next slide please yeah you see since today is the statistics day i think i thought that i'll start with the quote uh, i say this is a great tribute uh, to professor malanobis by edward deming edward deming was one of the i think very very important uh, towering figure uh, in statistics but his contribution apart from sampling theory uh, was that the he contributed hugely in the industrialization effort of japan 
through introduction of the quality quality control and that kind of a thing and which which made uh, i think uh, japan's industrial success a really good story now if you look at uh, i am not going to read it fully but what he said is that no country developed under developed or over developed has such a wealth of information about its people large scale sample surveys and uh, the, the, it is uh, it is it is an aghast at malanobis plan for national sample survey of india and that's uh, that uh, coming from person like uh, uh, deming about uh, our statistical system and professor malanobis Uh, so we started with, with a big bang and actually after the second world war devastation when united nations constituted a small committee of uh, five or six people one of the experts was uh, professor mohan abish we are still not independent but by then professor mohan abish uh, rose to that level of name and fame as uh, that uh, he was there uh and then uh, see if you look at now come to the second quote that i quoted here uh, that is from prince varanavis scientific laws are not advanced by the principle of authority or justified by faith or media well philosophy statistics is the only court of appeal to novice it's a very great statement basically what we do in economics is that uh, we try to theorize things uh, with a lot of uh, lo- lot of logical constraint uh, logical kind of a thing uh, but then ultimately uh, whatever we theorize it has to be it has to be seen that that meets with the reality when we talk about meeting with the reality first thing that we need is that we need data and as we said that indian statistical system those days produced a whole lot of data which most of the other countries including developed countries did not have second thing thing is that the estimation and hypothesis these two are also the field which belong to the area of statistics so when we talk of econometrics basically it is economics mathematics and statistics and the raw material that we get by way of data and the the kind of a tools and techniques that is provided by statistics and the quantitative techniques of mathematics etc are also indispensable so to that extent when we talk of econometrics uh data is very important i must say that indian statistical society if i remember correctly 1972 had i think seminal contribution in terms of database of india the volumes that came out i uh, even today i think if people refer to those olden days people will be really uh, bewildered by what all we had i think in the econometric society professor panchamukhi has been pushing us for doing a similar kind of a thing uh, for some years now but uh, i think uh, somehow or other uh, i think we have not been able to uh, i think uh, come up to his expectation uh, let me hope i think this uh, award uh, i think makes my responsibility as a little more and uh, let me let me hope that we should be able to do this uh, trying to get uh, the right kind of people uh, to start with and do this okay now let us go to the second one second slide come on get to the please uh, yeah now i said that in the in the context of uh, fundamental principles of uh, official statistics if you see this there are two principles that i have quoted there are six other principles uh, which talk about dissemination etc but the first principle is uh, very very important official statistics provide an indispensable element in the information system of a democratic society again 
डेमोक्रेटिक सोसाइटी इज इम्पोर्टेंट इंडिस्पेंसिबल एलिमेंट इज इम्पोर्टेंट सर्विंग द गवर्नमेंट द इकोनॉमिक एंड द पब्लिक विद डेटा अबाउट द इकोनॉमिक डेमोग्राफिक सोशल एंड एनवायरमेंट एनवायरमेंटल सिचुएशन टू दिस एंड ऑफिशियल स्टेटिस्टिक्स दैट मीट द टेस्ट ऑफ प्रैक्टिकल यूटिलिटी आर टू बी कंपाइल्ड एंड मेड अवेलेबल on an impartial basis okay on an impartial basis by official statistical agencies to honor citizens entitlement to public information i think uh, most of the words in this principle one are very important this only shows that official statistics is of paramount importance and i think keeping this in view and considering uh, the india situation i wrote a paper in economic and political weekly in 2018 indian official uh, statistics digital transformation to honor citizens the word honor citizens i picked up from here second principle is that to retain trust in official statistics statistical agencies need to decide according to strictly professional considerations including scientific principles and professional ethics on the methods and procedures for the collection processing storage and presentation of statistical data so sound methodology are required also uh this should be this should be available to the people uh, for the kind of a research uh, to go deeper into what is all happening uh, so from that point of view also uh, those of us who are econometricians particularly who, who are applied econometrician for us uh, the data are particularly important but if you look at say see in today's world everybody talks uh, about economic performance based on the data so data as professor panchamukhi said should be of high quality uh, should be consistent should have credibility and should be also timely and these are these are what uh, i think uh, uh, dr rangarajan committee which was appointed in 2000 submitted his report in 2001 where professor panchamukhi contributed a huge lot particularly in trade and industrial statistics he has he has taken so much of pains even today when i read and i find out that such a wonderful report professor panchamukhi has left for the uh, india uh, this uh, statistical system i think we have still to implement uh, some of the major recommendations i think uh, we we as a part of indian econometric society need to discuss and debate uh, how do we how do you go about to achieve uh, what all we have been intending to do now let us go to the next uh, slide next slide please yeah i i start with the system of national records 2008 this is the latest one now let me give you by way of some background of national records uh, basically during second world war uh, it is uh, simon kuznets who is basically an economist a statistician a uh, mathematician who has given the responsibility to, to understand how how the economy is getting impacted by the second world war and how the um, people are making their ears uh, meet and what is likely to happen now uh, if you look at uh, you see uh, the the structural part of a structural transformation when uh, see how he says that we move from agriculture to industry to services as we progress and uh, the urbanization part of it uh, this is the, these are some of the i think pioneering contribution that simon was less means so he had this background of basically economics mathematics and statistics all together uh, there is uh, another gentleman uh, who i should mention is the richard stone who with with meet was the uh, author of first uh, system of national accounts which was 
1953. Richard Stone had the similar kind of a background of economics, mathematics, and statistics. Uh, while those days uh, data are limited, but the way data have to be integrated to give a meaning, I think uh, if you read the this uh, voluminous uh, uh, SNA 2008, uh, there is a lot that we learn on economics, particularly macroeconomics, and and how how the statistics get built up, and what are the objectives and uh, 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 that kind of a thing. Uh, it provides a framework which is basic framework for our macroeconomic accounts for policy making, analysis, and research purposes. But uh, the second bullet, I think, is very important considering the present time. The SNA is designed to provide information about the behavior of institutional units. That means what is our institutional units, government, corporate sector, household sector, uh, uh, then uh, not-for-profit institutions, and that kind of a thing, uh, which are our institutional units and activities with which they engage, namely production, consumption, and accumulation assets in an analytically useful form. If you see the SNA, I think every economist should go through the SNA part of it. It's available easily, uh, downloadable uh, through Google search. Data on transaction provide the basic source material from which the values uh, of the various elements in the accounts are built up or derived. There would be considerable, uh, this is uh, what I will stress on, there will be considerable analytical advantages in having micro, micro tables that are fully compatible with the corresponding macro accounts for sectors or the total economy. I think I will stress again and again on this as we go ahead. Given the continuing improvement in computers and communication, the management and analysis of very large microdata is becoming progressively easier. Data can be derived from a variety of different sources, uh, our business records, as well as uh, uh, specially conducted census and surveys. So now the question that comes out is that during those days when we started statistics, see Roger Keynes, Simon Kuznets, or Richard Stone, for them, see even if they understood that microdata are required to make a story out of it, they did not have the possibility. In fact, Richard Stone wrote somewhere that without uh, microdata, we are missing a whole lot. And particularly as a statistician, because we are trained uh, with distributions. So, you see, our idea is that get the frequencies, make it into distribution, for try to fit it into theoretical distributions, getting into some kind of a parameters, and we talk about the distribution through these parameters. So, for example, normal distribution is fully explained by mean and standard deviations. Uh, but then question comes out is that uh, when we put it as a part of aggregate, uh, what happens is that we we do not get enough information about the distribution. And this is why when we deal with the aggregates, I say, uh, the question is that well, we, we presume a symmetric distribution uh, which is not correct because our, each of our variable income, consumption, asset, etc. are highly skewed distributions. I will come to other problems uh, that come up. So as a result of which, even at the broad level, though we could draw inference, uh, but then uh, without microdata, uh, we have serious problems. So that uh, will come to. Let us go to the next item. So my point is that SNA is very important. It's, so uh, this is what, uh, while reviewing uh, Professor Nachne's uh, book uh, on critique of uh, uh, macroeconomics, I uh, say in EPW, I wrote about macroeconomics. Macroeconomics attempts to explain aggregate fluctuations in an economy by looking for changes in business cycle attributable to causal factors. It, uh, it serves a very important purpose of interpreting market signals uh, 
the applying such theory to that extent there is no doubt a fundamental principle of macroeconomics is that aggregate demand and supply play out in the market in behavioral context so economics is always a behavioral science and that's what is the very very important part it plays out in behavioral context the rule of the whole is considered different from the behavior of its parts uh, this is true that uh, rule of the whole is behavior but then see the question is that since that even the statistical science has advanced quite a lot uh, data science has improved quite a lot so what we considered to be serious uh, of serious limitation those days i think in the information age i think it is no longer so that also i'll talk the mainstream theory assumes rational expectation and general equilibrium as normal under which rate variables that is inflation interest rate exchange rate wage rate unemployment rate are determined these rate variables impact allocation of resources for production consumption and investment this is how we call allocative efficiency that is brought about by the market forces we look for growth we look for equity but allocative efficiency is another very very important part again uh, here the issue is that market should be efficient market should clear uh, it should be frictionless uh, the question is that uh, then again next is that if the wages and prices are completely flexible as assumed in the classical economics everybody willing to work has an opportunity to get employed the interest rate in the money and loan market and wage rate in labor market adjust to uh, maintain equilibrium now the next question is that uh, uh, that uh, you see uh, my, uh, i am not able to see uh, uh, let me let me get into my notes a little bit uh, now uh, the reality is uh, uh, is different and hence there is unemployment and underemployment and the economy works below its potential so that's that's what is the question so the whatever assumptions macroeconomic make when we look at uh, the unemployment unemployment i am not talking about imperfections of the market that is another kind of a thing so these all uh, there is a fundamental question about uh, we are not getting enough from macroeconomics alone let us go to the next slide that is again uh, an important slide uh this is by oec and uh, 2019 i think uh, i found it to be very appealing because uh, there are certain fundamental concepts of economics which are questioned uh, in this and that too coming from oec which is now see these are the these are these are the economies which have been practicing macroeconomics in a big way but uh, in today how do they stand the critical idea the common thread that runs through our argument is that economics and economic policy need properly to understand the uh, sociality sociality of human life people are not individual utility maximizers that is the oh, fundamental one fundamental assumptions of economic economics or orthodox uh, of orthodox economic myth very strong word they have yes orthodox economic myth they have multi dimensional preferences and ethics formed in social and cultural settings so there is a reflexive intervention between individual economic decisions and social forces working itself out in social uh uh in so social institutions and pro political processes this means that our conception of economic progress needs to extend 
beyond individual material prosperity to include indicators of social well-being, which we presume as exogenous. Cohesion and empowerment and the environmental boundaries of human activity. Uh, these are very strong words, uh, which we, we say apart from um, the skewness, etc. I told, these are certain other very important dimensions which are to be considered. Our framework of economic analysis needs to acknowledge the social, historical, political, and environmental context of economic behavior and the feedback loops between individual decisions and societal dynamics. Our approach to policy should go beyond the traditional instruments of economic policy to encompass institution, social policy, and political narratives. I think uh, because the time has arrived and through this we can get a whole lot more of insight on the economy, uh, in my view, these are very, very important things. Come to the next one. Uh, next one. Now, this is again, again uh, Michael Porter is a uh, Harvard uh, uh, Business School, uh, very renowned professor. Uh, he did his PhD in the early 70s. Uh, he, this is the quote about India, a very important one, which I share in many others. So some of you who attended my earlier talks, you must be knowing that. Developing countries again and again are tripped up by microeconomic failures. Countries can engineer parts of growth through macroeconomic and financial reforms that bring floods of capital and cause the illusion of progress as construction craze not this kind line. Unless firms are fundamentally improving their operations and strategies and competition is moving to a higher level. So there are a few words here. Improving the opportunity strategies and competition is moving to the higher end. The production possibility frontier and car and the technology, all this opens up with this kind of a thing. However, growth will be snapped out as jobs fail to materialize, wages uh, stagnate and return to investment growth disappointing. India has the list of low income countries with microeconomic capability that can be unlocked by microeconomic and political reforms. Now, why I devoted uh, this much of time on this kind of a thing? The, the kind of a thing which I want to put across is that, say, time has now come to think of economy as together, micro and acro, together. Can we do it? Let us go to, to the next slide. I think that will give some more insight on this. Next slide, please. You see, uh, since we are econometricians, uh, this is what is very important. Models to be of relevance to the new world must rest on two pillars. That is, micro behavior of individuals and structure of their mutual interactions. Now, uh, this, this covers both micro and individual, uh, their structural interactions will take us to the level of macro, but more or less in a distributional context. That is the kind of a message. It is not the aggregates, but we talk about distributions, but I won't go to, into that kind of a high level of statistics to uh, on stochastic processes and a stochastic process at multivariate space uh, to take into that kind of a thing. I, I think uh, that will keep for some other day. But what is possible is that uh, this is what is much more realistic. Uh, let us get into Lucas critic, everybody knows. But this observation of Lucas, uh, which really gives further uh, you see, I, I think I get a lot of inspiration here. Lucas said that the term micro and macro should eventually disappear. 
Most interesting recent developments in macroeconomic theory seem to me to be discernible as the uh, reincorporation of aggregate problems such as inflation and the business cycle within the general framework of microeconomic theory. If these developments succeed, he term macroeconomic uh, will simply the term macroeconomic will simply disappear from use and the modifier micro will become superfluous. We will simply speak as did Smith, Ricardo, Marshall and Walras of economic theory. I don't understand uh, this great economist as much so being, being basically a statistician. Uh, I have the background. But it's a, it's a very clear message that for our young people, uh, the way forward is to find out a way to overcome the limitations that we had in the past of not having micro data. And we should be in a position to build our models based on uh, micro, micro, micro to get it to the macro. So, another thing is that uh, we are dealing with evolutionary process that cannot be stationary and that economic behavior is determined both by individual and society as a whole through a complex adaptive system. So, this is a part of evolutionary economics. Again, uh, we have been talking about for quite some time, but now I think there is a strong research group on evolutionary uh, economics, uh, which tries to, you see, there are problems with the uh, economics. There is a problems of heterogeneity, problem of non-linearity, problem of path dependence. Each of them, may, possibly, we have to explain quite a lot. But look at the country as India as a huge country. See, uh, what, is, what is obtaining in Gujarat is completely different from what is obtaining in Assam, the state from which I come from. What is obtaining in uh, Himachal Pradesh must be different uh, altogether from Kerala or uh, Tamil Nadu. But when we set targets at the macro level, we try to we try to uh, see things in a completely different way. So what is important is that we must be in a position to know the reality at the at the at a aggregate a small small area level, where the things are much more homogeneous. And so this is where, uh, what we call, uh, uh, in statistics, we have tools called multi-level analysis. Multi-level analysis has its own challenges on intra-correlation, inter intercorrelation, and that kind of a thing. But that literature has also developed. So idea is that we should be in a position to build models at district level, define district level, find out the differences between the districts, and from districts, through a nesting manner, we go to the state level and from st nesting, we can go up to the uh, central level. In fact, today's data warehouse, which I'll come just now, can take us to the ultimate unit of data because data warehouse provides for that flexibility to get into the ultimate generality of the data. And you can, you can, uh, you can build, you can find out that you have a whole lot, uh, plus so much of micro data I see allows you to estimate probabilities, estimate transition uh, transition processes, and there are there are probability theories and combinatorics which allows us cause and effect relationship also in a kind of a multivariate context in a stochastic context. So that is the that is the literature in the quantitative theory which is again at a very cutting edge which at this stage, I don't understand much, but I understand the flavor. I understand what they are going to talk about. But we need to possibly uh, raise our uh, research effort uh, to go into that level, particularly for the younger generation of people uh, who are attending. I think today you are much better off in various ways. I think we should be in a position to do it. Let us go to the next uh, kind of a, next slide. So now, uh, you see, uh, let us talk of the uh, 
uh, changing nature of the data. Now here the Google hit. He said there were five exabytes of information created between the dawn of civilization through 2003. But that much information is now created every two days and the pace is increasing. Big data and data science occupy a central place in the use of such huge volume of ever increasing data for business benefit. So this is where we stand today. The government is now collecting huge volume of data, implementing e-governance, land records are getting digitized, government revenue and expenditure are uh, greatly digitized, uh, GST, etc. Trade data, particularly foreign trade was always, uh, transaction data was available as Professor Panchamukhi has been working. So, there transport, health, insurance, banking, sustainable development goals, other uh, uh, regulatory institutions, Panchetiraj and so on, which throw up huge volume of data. What we need is to make a very good use of this data for a knowledge economy to harvest the potential for high economic growth and sustain balanced socio-economic development. To uh, expeditiously attain a state of uh, high growth and uh, seeing that uh, free of poverty and hunger. And in my view, uh, uh, we, we, it, is, it is time. And this is the kind of a challenge that we have as an econometric community today. And then uh, we need to find out how do we go about it. Let us get into the next, uh, next slide. Next one, please. So this I have taken from Wikipedia, big data. See, big data is a, uh, is a, is a field, a field that treats ways to analyze, systematically extract information from, or otherwise deal with data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing application software. Data with many fields, columns, of our data statistical power while data with higher complexity may lead to higher fast discovery rates. Big data analysis challenges include capturing data, storage, etc., etc., and it, it is talks about volume, variety, and velocity, etc. So today, today generation talk about big data, data warehouse, and our whatever artificial intelligence we are talking about, ma, 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 this uh, machine learning that we are talking about, these are all the outcome of availability of huge data and training the data in a different way, taking non-linearity as given, not we don't make it a linear. In most of the time, economics we try to make it linear, but uh, you see, in the in the kind of a neural network parlor, non-linearity is assumed as given, and it's a different algorithm altogether. It takes the huge capacity of computer, but that computer is getting into that kind of a uh, mode of um, the capacity, and that's what I, I don't have time to deal with the wonders that is going on in the name of big data. Let us get into the next one. Next, please. See, this is what uh, in my 2018 paper, paper I, I got this uh, kind of a thing. We get the data in the left hand side by various mode digitally capture, get into the staging area. And from out of that, we get this data uh, through what we call a data lake uh, into a special big data warehouse. Uh, there are a few stages are involved. Then uh, we we call special uh, online online analytical reporting system, and here of course is a data mining possibility. But top is very important. Each and data element has a tag, which is a GIS code. That is which has a geographical information system built into this. And once you have this, we can get into the geography, including my village. If my village is geocoded, in, uh, 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 geocoded, I should be in a position to see what has happened to my village, what is happening, how many buildings are coming up. These are all possible because data are getting captured. So for getting a building building permission, 
we get the get it to government kind of a thing for getting connection of electricity we get the information from the electricity authority and you see some people, some people even conclude by seeing the uh, light from the sky that is uh, which area is developed which area is not developed so all these have become possible uh, through this process so this is the kind of a thing which we need to build it's not easy it has to be built brick by brick and in reserve bank we have progressed a lot because we started this process in 1998 as professor vanumurthy was saying that today you get a whole lot more data uh, from the reserve bank because um, we we went through that process of uh, data warehousing and now of course we are moving into big data to get into this kind of a mode though for public somehow so much of granular data is still not available but uh, it is accessible uh, it can be done uh, it can be accessed in various ways now let us get into the next one next slide so as econometricians we always will like uh, real sector fiscal sector financial sector and external sector data should be integrated in such a manner that our our macroeconometric models building blocks are basically this but the question is that if we are in a position to get this micro data we can try to look at it uh, if not below right from the district level i will only give you an example i have a house about 90 kilometers away from mumbai uh, in a village area uh, they are see there is no dust of water there is a river vitarna uh, professor panchamukhi since he left uh, long years in mumbai may be knowing every year three months huge lot of water just goes into arabian sea see we have not been able to do minor irrigation to preserve it as a result what happens farmers get only one crop that is pretty if we are in a position to harness that water somebody can do fishing or you know, doing that somebody can get at least one more crop we are now going to complete almost 74 years of our independence now if we are in a position to push the uh, capital for investment first of all capital is not there for investment private sector will not invest in this kind of an areas because they don't see a great business there though if you look at microfinance our people make a lot of is a, a lot of money out of microfinance because the idle lever get converted through some kind of a loan and that converted productivity gains they are in a position to repay loan to the extent of paying about 25% of interest rate and still making a lot of money now these are the opportunities which do not come into the limelight because this kind of a data we don't have similarly fiscal kind of a data the government spends a huge lot of government government size is about 25% of the total economy even more uh, professor vanamurthy will be much better off uh, in this kind of a thing question is that today each and every amount is given through digital transaction through e payment now if we are in a position to get this data at that kind of a level through geo coding we will get to know what is really happening through intervention through the governments what is happening to the financial sectors that kind of a thing then of course at a broader level uh, you see when it comes to the question of demand and supply and external sector is very important i think that is a little more difficult but this is the kind of a data if we are in a position to build i think it will be a lovely thing for an econometrician uh, to get into and this is doable only thing we must have clear vision and we should start maybe it will take 5 years it will take 10 years but we will be there and then through type studies taking uh, small small places we econometrician should be in a position to come out with models to find out what are the important variables what are the important determinants uh, de determinants of income important determinants of consumption important determinants of saving and and so on come to the next slide next slide please see these are only illustrative some five questions that i i i i put up every time Uh, say a farmer in a village should know what is the best possible yield per acre 
in his area how dif uh, different it is from the india based global based etc this gap analysis informed him uh, how to improve productivity immediately we come to data envelopment analysis through the process of data envelopment analysis we are in a position to find out what is the distance between the best uh, best possible and the person who is there and today through mobile phone we can tell the farmers each and uh, farmers that look here your productivity is so much as compared to the best possible in your own area i am not talking about the others if you look at india's uh, paddy cultivation india produces 3700 Uh, kilogram of paddy per hectare whereas china produces almost 6000 kg of paddy per hectare china's arable land is lower than india's but its productivity is almost 70% 80% their fertilizer consumption is almost three times that of ours even vietnam who have learned the kind of an agricultural this is smart agriculture practices from india i think their productivity is almost 50% more than ours i am not talking about uh, israel i am not talking about certain other countries now the question that comes out is that why they are able to do all these things and why we have not been able to do this similarly manufacturing similarly financial sector where risk and return becomes very important and when all the transaction that are the risk return parlor uh, see we we must know you see what is banking it is basically asset liability management and there are bucket after bucket uh, with peculiar aspects of asset liability management and today we capture the data by bucket by bucket to do that kind of an analysis uh, so uh, you see uh, they, they are the people who have to hire data scientists they have to hire econometricians to get into those kind of a level uh, if we are in a position to do that see not only will get better jobs but will will help the country to move at a uh, much faster pace and government also will get much better input i in fact we need a metric at each level to measure what is the government's objective and what did they perform what is the gap it's not that uh, the way we we try to measure it is not that see our institutions and governance need a lot of improvement and what more uh, if we get all these data to measure the governance and the failure of institutions see the implementation of corruption in india india is rated 163 in the world who comes and invests in that kind of a situation why should we have such a low see kind of a implementation of uh, the corruption as a contract contract agreements we need this kind of data let us go to the last i think this is the my concluding one i will not take much time last slide please get into last slide please hello hello yeah this is my concluding remarks whatever i said basically is uh, said here economics explains economy in behavioral context it is very rich analytically however the paradigm eludes consensus because of unrealistic theoretical assumptions and relatively weak empirical support we need a framework for analysis consistent with empirical reality heterogeneity non linearity and path dependence this appears difficult at the present state of knowledge we can however try out alternative paradigms for empirical validity to explain what is needed for informed strategy uh, rational policy making its monitoring and evaluation for optimal use of available resources as i say optimal use of resources thereby i mean today if we ask uh, i always keep on uh, checking with professor vanjul mahamurthy what is the what is the our uh, uh, the uh, 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 possible uh, productivity maximum that we can go uh, say that 7 or 8% now i believe that uh, there can be a huge possibility for raising productivity and uh, if china could uh, uh, grow at 10% or more for uh, 30 years 
uh, is it not possible for us to improve productivity uh, to raise raise our GDP growth to that level. And also, if we follow the policy of inclusive growth, I think what we say and poverty uh, and hunger should be a thing of the past, like China has more or less done it. For such empirical analysis, we need a sound system for organizing huge volume of multidimensional data and systems and processes for dynamic analysis for policy. We need to use information and communication technology to collect, collect, process, analyze, and disseminate findings for policy at all levels. Big data, data science, and analytics, including econometrics, can lend support for extracting knowledge on complex patterns and dependency. So high quality information system for deep, uh, for deep insight on productivity and competitiveness in global context, uh, interventions and right intervention, efficient intervention to use market information, etc. Now is definitely going to give us higher growth, not only one shot, two shot, on a sustained basis, and a much better lifestyle. So these are uh, some of the things uh, which I feel is possible. But uh, for that, we need to do a lot of work. First of all, as our raw material, we must get the data. We should have the access of the data. Dissemination policy should be much more user friendly. But uh, there are some data on which our experiment uh, can go on by our young econometricians. They look at our corporate sector. Corporate sector accounts for almost one third of our economy. Here, uh, the company wise data for many of the companies is available. Reserve Bank covers more than 20,000, 30,000 uh, companies. Ministry of Corporate Affairs, according to Ministry of Statistics, has uh, lacks of data. Now, the issue comes out is that uh, corporate sector is very important because it covers the large sector. If we can make them efficient, if we can get uh, inject more and more competition into it i think they can they can play a big role in the global competitive environment and these data uh, we should be in a position to extract because these data are available in the system uh, how do you extract and what do you do is possible uh, we, similarly government kind of a data i see this is again uh, most of it is available whether we will be able to get access or not is another thing. But it again covers about 25% uh, uh, of the economy. Again, again, a big chunk. Coming to household kind of a data, uh, certain data like land record is getting computerized. And certain other data through survey should supplement them. Uh, so like that, we should be in a position to build by way of census, by way of surveys, by way of other uh, kind of a approximations, uh, this kind of a thing, and slowly, slowly we can try to improve upon it. It is not an one shot affair. UK has taken now almost uh, uh, 20 years to build this, but uh, they have a commitment and they are going in a systematic manner. Australia was way ahead, uh, which, which gave me uh, see, inspiration for going for data warehouse for uh, a reserve bank way back in 1998. So these are all which are in the realm of possibility. Now the question comes is that uh, there are there are there are challenges. First of all, in terms of our at the topmost level, getting convinced that this is what we need. If India has to grow at double digit. Second level is that uh, our bureaucracy and administration, which create huge kind of hurdles uh, on, I, 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 in my paper, Indian official statistics, I have given some examples uh, what happens and how we duplicate, triplicate our effort and waste resources. I don't want to report them. So this, uh, we need to, uh, all of us have to fall in line. 
to get what is possible uh, to make India much better in terms of our sustained high uh, GDP growth, which should also be inclusive. I think my next paper, which is uh, just getting ready, uh, the title is that uh, Sustaining High uh, Economic Growth, uh, an Integrated Approach for Broad-Based Knowledge Economy. So what I say is that it is the knowledge economy which will take us there. And for that, the official statistics is very important. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. I have taken more times than what I should have normally taken. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. And thank you for this very insightful talk. And also, uh, I know you have put all your experience uh, in this uh, presentation. And some of the questions that you raised are very useful for uh, all the people who are working in applied econometrics and all those things. Uh, so can I request Professor Panchamukhi to say a few words? Professor Panchamukhi, sir? Okay, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so I fully agree with your observation that uh, it has been a very insightful lecture covering many dimensions. We had uh, one go over the, the distinction between macro and macro, and I like the word sociability of human life, social uh, socialness of human life. And the multi-dimensional nature, I found in one of these interviews, considering India is not one country, but several countries, each district is a country. So we need to recognize this uh, uh, multi-dimensionality of uh, human life and the need for looking at different dimensions uh, in, a, in an integrated uh, manner. Uh, not just the macro and the other day there was a lecture um, uh, by Dr. Raghavendra Jha on uh, the need for coordinating the fiscal policy and monetary policy. He emphasized on the macro. Then while commenting on that, I was changing that lecture also. And uh, I said that uh, you can't have one macro and uh, uh, one macro interest rate and macro tax rate for a large country like India, particularly during the pandemic, we have got the multiplicity of our economy. And so in that sense, uh, Dr. Burman has uh, laid the foundations of uh, uh, many issues in the new dimensions of econometrics or the, the development model. And his um, emphasis on uh, big data is something which he has been doing all along. We were in the he mentioned about big data need for coordinating big data in a proper manner. Big data are available, but how to combine them, how to analyze them, how to delimit them to analytical tools is the big issue. <laughs> it's not so simple. Uh, and his emphasis on that is very And ultimately, his uh, uh, great analysis of sustainable development and uh, the, the raw material of data should be made available for modeling. On the whole, I found it to be very, very interesting and uh, very comprehensive, as he is always. Uh, when we throw the thing for patterns and operations by the participants, and then I will come back afterwards and towards the end once again. Are there any questions? So, Bhano, we can do it. Yeah. 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 Vipin, is there any questions in the chat box? Uh, yeah, there are one or two questions. Yeah, you can, you can raise that and. Uh, uh, yeah. So let me uh, raise one question that uh, we got uh, through, uh, when, through the registration form. It, uh, somebody had emailed. Okay. So this question is specifically regarding the role of private sector in bringing up the data. I, I think it can be connected with uh, Dr. Berman's lecture when he was talking about the five uh, uh, five areas, uh, five points. You know, to be happy, you know, the farmer could uh, get access to uh, the data regarding the price. 
right? So, you know, especially this question is related to, you know, it would apply in the context of finance and risk. So, the question is, uh, why, why we do not have uh, many private players in the market uh, who would uh, give access to data? We have one CMI, uh, apart from that, uh, most of the other data is restricted. Right. So what is the role or what is the incentive for these private players in, in the Indian market to gather data? And mm. No, you see, first of all, today, private sector is gathering a huge lot of data. One of the, a few sources of their data, say, for example, Amazon. Amazon gathers a huge lot of data about the individuals, they are uh, buying, frequency of buying, the taste preferences, etc. Uh, like that, the, the kind of a, today we talk in the information age, it's a kind of a platform. And through that platform, everybody is basically looking forward to consumer data. And they are trying to figure out that what works for the consumer and what does not work for the consumer. Say, for example, financial sector that we talked about. Now, the, the, there is a huge competition because our financial sector is highly inefficient in some. If you look at net interest margin uh, in India for the organized financial sector is about 2.5% to 3%. Whereas in Europe, it is about 1%. In USA, it is uh, it is uh, a little above one percent, less than one point five percent. That's why many people from abroad want to come and uh, enter Indian market because they see there's a huge opportunity. Similarly, look at the digital payments because through digital payments they want to get a whole lot of data on the payments kind of a thing. And the you know the billions of transactions are taking pl place through the digitization of. Uh, India. That to our digitization is not even 10%. Another 90% has to happen. That's why, see, if you look at stock market, huge rush, they know that if Indian market slowly, slowly can get expanded through digitization and a uh, whole lot. So the private people in some way willy-nilly are getting, capturing a huge lot of data. The question that comes out is that how do we get this data in a systematic manner uh, for the researchers like us. Now, let me, when I talked about the payment system, uh, the retail payment system, clearing and settlement is done basically by two organizations, that's National Payment Corporation of India and the Reserve Bank of India. Now, this, the transaction-wise data without identity, but if it is geocoded. Most of the time, it is geocoded also. If we are in a position to get, and these are all basically a, a public sector. You can say, uh, then uh, it is. It is. It is basically we have to overcome the rules, regulations, and convince the uh, these two entities to share this data for a particular research purposes. I think it, it gives a huge lot of data. Similarly, as I said that. Uh, the uh, kind of a uh, private sector, uh, say, say health health sector data. Again, whole lot of whole lot of health initiatives are coming out through this uh, kind of a platforms. So, and we should be in a position to get kind of a data on the health kind of a thing. So, uh, saying there is a huge role of private sector, and private sector, you see, we should be in a position to first of all understand. Uh, how do we get them? While they pursue their interest, see, uh, uh, you, uh, with some kind of anonymity, etc., which uh, takes their interest in tech, at the same time we get the data, possibly there is a scope to, uh, there is a scope to go about it. But I will rather say, the, uh, this should go on simultaneously. But first, our most important thing is that the government is a huge preview of this data. Uh, which why we should not be in a position to uh, take up at the first instance. This is entirely official statistics means it's a government basically data. Why we should not be able to do it? Private sector data, yes, I agree. We can do it and we have a whole lot of opportunity to do it. It requires a movement and I don't know how to bring about this movement.
Okay, so we have another question. Uh, this, uh, two questions can be clubbed together and read. Uh, is uh, data manipulation possible at uh, uh, high levels of power authorities or you know, during the age of uh, uh, internet uh, and telecommunication? How can we assure about the quality and credibility of the data, especially you know from the government's uh, context? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. You see, this is where uh, the big data and data warehouse come handy in a big way. Because when you are in a position to drill down, drill down from aggregate to the ultimate granular level, how the aggregate is built up through the granular level, uh, that, that gets exposed. And when you say ultimate granular level, we can verify this. Today, see, all India level, there is a data inconsistency. How, how do you remove this? It is only through some kind of a statistical techniques or judgments. But the moment you get this data at the district level, say, for example, district is not that big. In that kind of a situation, data quality issue becomes much more focused, much more addressable. And we are in a position to address the data quality issues through disaggregation. And India is a decentralized statistical system. Uh, we have no option to get out of this system. But what is required is to put this system in such a way that integrates with the decentralization system so that every aggregate through metadata, we are in a position to go to the ultimate granularity data and ensure quality, consistency, and coherence. If I remember, Arvind Subramaniam raised quite a lot of questions about our GDP data through alternative sources of data. And our official statistical system did not have a clear answer based on the data because they did not have the system to confront him. But why should it happen? We must be in a position to, uh, we have made a lot of noises uh, in the, uh, with the current GDP series uh, to see that thing change. And I don't want to get into the detail, you people all know. But uh, I think we have to we have to find out a way to overcome this kind of a problems. So we have a few more people who have raised their hands. So I'm going to allow uh, one or two of them uh, who can uh, answer. Uh, Kiran, are you are you there, Kiran? Kiran, you can unmute and uh, talk. Ask your question. Uh, Kiran? Okay. Uh, Dr. Deepa Lakshmi? Uh, Kiran? Hello. Yeah. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, actually, my question is related to how we will uh, sir choose any variables which is independent in one aspect but dependent in other aspect uh, i think uh, i think i look for uh, more confirmed conversation uh, dr vanimurthy professor vanimurthy to get into this question more appropriately than what i will be in a position to give Uh, Professor Vanamurthy, you are there? So, sorry, I could not hear that, sir. I was talking somewhere. Uh, the question sorry. is that, uh, you see, the sum variable uh, which is independent in one aspect and dependent in another aspect and how do we address this issue? Uh, you can, you can, uh, uh, you can, you can uh, ask her to repeat the question. And, yeah, no, uh, I think this question we can uh, deal with, maybe let her write with us, we will do, do that. Let us ask okay. questions uh, relevant to the lecture. I think that will be better. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah. Kiran, we can discuss later. Fine. Okay, sir. Yeah. yeah. Kiran, one last question if it is uh, relevant to the presentation. And it looks like uh, he is uh, able to ask the question. I guess the, that's it. No other questions, sir. Thank you. Yeah. That's it from the Q&A session.
Somebody has asked the question, son, why you are not concerned with the stationarity of data, with the big data? I don't know. There was, uh, there was one more question uh, uh, that was specific to uh, why there, uh, why we are uh, not concerned about stationarity testing big data and machine learning techniques. I guess that's a very uh, specific question. Hey. Yeah. Now, for our modeling purposes, uh, because this is the assumption that we need and we need to test uh, that uh, it follows stationarity. And if it does not follow uh, stationarity, then, uh, then there, are, there are problems with the estimation part. Now, the question that comes out is that uh, uh, I was talking more uh, data more from the distributional aspect uh, rather than from the aggregate aspect and the econometric uh, or regression setup under which we talk about uh, uh, stationarity. When we talk about the disaggregated data, we get into a different kind of an econometrics uh, where we try to find out uh, the how how uh, one entity moves from one state to another state and with uh, what kind of a probability. And uh, so that, that gives, uh, you see, even if it is a heterogeneous distribu uh, distribution, uh, that heterogeneous distribution is broken into homogeneous subgroups. And then jump, jump process from one homogeneous subgroup to another hom homogeneous subgroup is considered and huge data allows us to get into that kind of a probability and that kind of a transition process. Next question comes out is that whether this transition probability uh, will lead to stationary state or will not lead to st uh, stationary state uh, because we talk about the equilibrium. So the, uh, when we talk about the equilibrium, the stationarity and not leading to stationarity uh, is an area I think which is a, which is a part of advanced uh, uh, statistics. Our uh, people work, I think we need to go to the experts to get us into that. But I try to give you that in a micro micro linkage setup, uh, how we visualize the analysis in a particular way. And if you go through my paper, 2019 paper, there is a reference, uh, Aoki and Ashukawa. Uh, that paper deal with the issues, problems of the stationarity, non-stationarity, homogeneity, non homogeneity, and how to deal with. And chapter two deals with basically probability, probability distributions and all. So we basically move away from the regression setup. You see, the regression setup, uh, you see, I, I only give you an example. Uh, this is my view. Suppose we have 100 people. Each of them, we have given the same amount of capital and same amount of labor. And our uh, OLS will expect them to produce the same kind of an output and everything else will go to the error kind. But if you look at it, in reality, there will be differences. And that probability and differences, that is what is not available through the regression setup that we, we, are, we, are, we are very conversant with today. And this is where I think regression setup is fine for aggregation for broad views, but they are not good enough to give enough insight on the dynamics of the data and the evolutionary process. That's what I will leave at. Yeah, uh, I think we are uh, uh, almost uh, uh, it's class 530. Is uh, Professor Pachmaki want to say something? Otherwise, uh, I'll request uh, Bipin to give what time. Yes. Well, one, one of my uh, hobby uh, issues is yeah. to say that man is not an economic man. He is not based on materialism, but the spiritual dimension of him. You have to take the holistic view of the man by considering both the economic dimension and various other economic dimensions of his behavior. This uh, conception comes closer to your side on beyond growth, force and new economic approach to his when you mention about a man, an individual is not limited to maximize the uh, author of the economic health. They have a dimension and such an effort and understand the sociability of human life. 
ನಾವು ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಶ್ರೀಹರಣ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಸೆಂಟ್ರಲ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್
And of course, the five uh, major points that you raised is of uh, big relevance to all the uh, all the future researchers. They can play a role. Uh, our own students uh, who are uh, looking into data analytics uh, can think about uh, creating some models. And I must tell you, sir, uh, our students use DBIE database and uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I mean, I have given a lot of assignments assignments to them, and all the faculties keep doing that. And uh, next time they know. Uh, whom to reach out if they are in any doubt regarding the data. Of course, uh, your suggestion for the need for the data that would re reflect the reality of uh, macro level as well as micro level uh, has to be specifically noted, especially when we are in the era of uh, big data, machine learning, high frequency data, and the artificial intelligence. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful lecture. Uh, we hope uh, uh, you will be able to visit our beautiful campus once uh, all the uh, pandemic-related uh, uh, problems are over. Uh, it's a beautiful, sprawling campus. Uh, we had uh, uh, participants from various uh, uh, various uh, streams of uh, academics, uh, students, corporates, etc. We would like to thank all the members of the Indian Economic Society for attending this program. Uh, our students, uh, uh, who are always eager to be a part of this uh, this kind of sessions, uh, also attended the um, session despite having exams. I thank the students as well. I also take this opportunity to thank all the participants from various other institutions and uh, who keep supporting uh, Base University uh, in all its uh, events as a new university. Uh, this is a huge encouragement for us. Uh, we will be hosting more events uh, in the future. We will have more interesting and uh, interesting speakers. Uh, we will be shortly coming up with a few workshops uh, for which you all shall uh, get the notification. Uh, we are part of uh, all the events, attend, uh, participate and share uh, these things among your friends. And uh, with this, uh, we shall end the session. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.